We worship this morning according to the common service on page 15 in the front of the hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Protect us by your strength and save us from the threatening dangers of our sins. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Old Testament lesson on this first Sunday in Advent from Isaiah chapter 43, beginning at verse 1. Now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So far the Old Testament lesson. 
our psalm of the day, these words of Psalm 24, Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. So far the psalm of the day. And our epistle lesson from Acts chapter 14 in our continuing study. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Ataliah. From Ataliah they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel is written in the 11th chapter according to St. Matthew, beginning at the first verse. After Jesus had finished instructing his twelve disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you. And more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. And he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. He who has ears, let him hear. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Let us join in confessing our faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. It's printed on page 19 in the front of the hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Our text in our continuing study of the Acts of the Apostles from the 14th chapter. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. From his deep dungeon, in a moment of doubt, that great Advent preacher, John the Baptist, sent his followers to Jesus with a question. Are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? He who comes is one of many titles attached in the Old Testament to the coming Savior. As in, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The word Advent itself means the coming. As in Christ, it's all about his coming. At Bethlehem, as one virgin born, into our hearts by faith through the gospel. And on that last day, when he comes to take us home, he who once came in a stable comes to us still in word and sacraments, by the word, water, and the blood. And as the Advent gospel advances in today's text to places like Iconium, Lystra, and Derby, we see the apostles also going through many hardships in order to do this. They themselves said we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country, where they continued to preach the good news. Paul and Barnabas enter into Iconium and they follow their usual pattern. There is a Jewish synagogue there. They enter into it. They talk to these people who already knew the Old Testament promises of a coming Savior. Their message meets with success. There are people, both Jews and Gentiles, who believe their message. But there are also others, and we see this pattern throughout his journeys, who poison the happy moment who stir up trouble among the Gentiles, particularly over Paul and Barnabas. This does not cause Paul and Barnabas to adjust their message. They instead continue to preach the word of God boldly. They do not put truth to a vote. They do not put their finger to the wind to see which way the breezes of popular opinion are blowing this week. They continue to preach. But once the Jews stir up trouble, and there's talk of stoning them, and they put out a hit on the courageous apostles, well, then Paul and Barnabas hit the road for Lystra. Not out of cowardice, but in obedience to what Jesus once said, when they persecute you in one place, flee to the next. There is a time to stand and die. 
There is also a time to continue to take the gospel to other places. And so the Advent gospel now advances to the city of Lystra. In Lystra there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. Well, now, no two mission fields are alike. And there is no Jewish synagogue in this city of Lystra. So these people do not know the one true triune God of the Old Testament. They don't know the prophecies of a coming Savior. And so Paul has to approach them from a different angle, from that of what we sometimes call the natural knowledge of God. But before we get to that, what we find in Lystra is, well, a congregation or a group of people that is situated in southern Galatia in kind of the backwoods. Uh, later on, we're going to meet the wine and caviar crowd over in Athens in chapter 17, uh, and, and they're into the deep philosophies and all that sort of thing. But in Lystra, here in the southern backwoods of Galatia, uh, you've got, well, the beer and pretzel crowd, and they still believe on the gods and Mount Olympus and Zeus and Hermes and Artemis and all that sort of thing. Well, sitting in the front row as Paul is preaching is a man lame from birth. I mean, he's never walked. The advent of the gospel creates faith in his heart but gives him another gift too. Paul looks straight at him and says, Stand up! Well, the guy doesn't just stand up, he jumps up! And he can walk. He's never even learned how to crawl. And of course, this is an impressive wonder. They were the credentials that God gave to his New Testament church before the New Testament scriptures were written down. Well, the people in Lystra, they are considerably impressed, but for all the wrong reasons. Pretty soon you start hearing shouts of, Zeus! Hermes! Because you see... These ancient people believed that every so often, Greek mythology, you know, that the gods would come down from Mount Olympus to spy on them. And so they figured that's what they had here. So you better be good, huh? And, and so uh, Paul they call Hermes. Hermes was the messenger god of the Greeks. And uh, uh, Barnabas they call Zeus, the king of the gods, because they figured, well, maybe he's kind of a strong, silent type, right? And he doesn't have a whole lot to say. And then the priest of Zeus gets involved in the whole thing uh, and, and, and decks out a couple of critters to offer up his sacrifice uh, to Paul and Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas don't even know what's going on because in the enthusiasm of the people, they've switched from talking the common Greek language to their Lyconian language, and now it's like, what's going on? And by the time Paul and Barnabas probably figure it out, well, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed into the crowd shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. So these folks don't know the true triune God of the Old Testament scriptures. And so Paul's got to start, as he will later in Athens, where we will expound on that in greater detail in chapter 17. He starts from the natural knowledge of God. What's that? Even though all people are born enemies of God, at war with God, utterly sinful and corrupt, there nonetheless remains a natural knowledge of God, kind of a blurred knowledge. Bad reception on your TV screen, right? A blurred knowledge that there is a God there is a creator who has made all things. And also a blurred conscience which says some things are right and some things are wrong. This natural knowledge of God is not enough to save anybody. For that you need 
the law of the Bible, which shows you your sin, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, which shows you your Savior. But it is enough for these people, as Paul would say in Romans 1, to be without excuse, to know better that they shouldn't be bowing down to statues of wood and stone. It is enough for them to know that the crops in their fields and, and, and the sky over their head with its rain and sunshine uh, testifies to them that there is an almighty creator. And yet for all of that, as they try to offer up sacrifices to them, Paul and Barnabas can scarcely succeed. And now the people of Lystra, they flip a switch. And some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day he and Barnabas uh, left for Derby. Historians tell us that the people of southern Galatia, people like here in Lystra, were a rather fickle and unstable lot. As a matter of fact, the Bible bears that out. Paul writes a letter to the people in this area later on, the letter to the Galatians, in which he says, Oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? In other words, one moment they believed the gospel, the next moment they were on some other train believing something else. Back and forth, a fickle lot. One only can imagine, of course, what the Apostle Paul would say to us modern-day faddish Americans who change our beliefs and opinions about things eternal as often as some people change socks. Well, the people now flip the switch, they turn on Paul, and they stone him. And they drag the poor guy outside the city and leave him there. And then something wondrous is the other believers kind of gather around his unconscious form and Bruised and battered, apostle gets up, dusts himself off, and hobbles back into the city because he feels a sermon coming on. Now, you might think nothing much happened with the gospel in a place like Lystra, but there were people who believed. Something else. There was a young man who watched all this happen. Couldn't do anything about it at the time. This young man, Paul would later call him my true son in the faith. And uh, this young man would later go along with Paul on the second missionary journey. And years later, when Paul is on death row in Rome, Paul will write a letter, his last, to this young man from Lystra. In fact, he would write two letters or epistles to this young man, the pages of the New Testament. His name is Timothy. The Advent gospel advanced into his heart, even as through much hardship, Paul did it. And you never know when you preach the gospel, where you're going to find a Timothy. In our gospel lesson, Jesus talked about that great Advent preacher, John the Baptist. He said he was this dividing line between the Old and New Testaments that all the prophets prophesied until John. But since John stepped into his wilderness pulpit, said Jesus, things changed, the gospel blossomed. And the gospel forcefully advanced and forceful men with hungry hearts laid hold of it in their spiritual hunger as never before. And so it happens as Paul goes forth with the Advent gospel. And from Lystra, he moves on to Derby. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia. And when they preached the word in Perga, they went down to Ataliah. From Ataliah, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. 
On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there for a long time with the disciples. We don't read that there was any opposition, any trouble when they went to the little town called Derby and preached the gospel there. Maybe the Jews who dogged Paul's steps thought that Paul had been done in, so they didn't dog his steps to that city. But when they are done preaching the word of God in Derby, and a good number of disciples are won through the preaching of the gospel, uh, Paul retraces his steps, goes back to Lystra, to Iconium, and then back to the city in Antioch, and eventually they come down, preach the gospel in a few other places, catch a boat, and they head back to Syrian Antioch, where the whole thing had started to report to the church that the door of faith had been opened to the Gentiles. You say, what's the point here? Paul retraces his steps. He revisits these churches, and it's not the only time he'll do it. He will do it again and again. That is because Paul's not a fly-by-night. When he plants the gospel, when he plants a church, he sinks down its roots. The text says they appointed elders or pastors in each of these churches. Maybe they were synagogue rulers who had been converted to Christ. They knew their Old Testament scriptures. But Paul did not leave these churches without guidance and without sinking down their roots deeply. And so it is that they remind them, they encourage them, remain true to the faith. And then a word of explanation for you. No, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. The persecutions will not be unusual. They will be par for the course. We must go through many hardships. The word for hardship or tribulation here is a word that has within it the picture of troubles pressing down on us to the point Pain. The idea of sad times squeezing and putting the squeeze on us, or of bad days bearing down on us. Some of the hardest hardships is the persecution for the gospel itself. And sometimes family, friends, co-workers, surely much of our modern day media continues to attack the very thing that you and I love and to isolate us on some island of ridicule for our belief in the Christ of God or in the scriptures. These are the heartaches that people go through when they come to faith in Christ. But the word through is operative here. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Oh, sometimes God may lead us out of the trouble. Or sometimes around it. But quite often, we must go through it. Our hand in his. Couples married for long years discover this, that there were times, difficult times, when one or the other or both thought the other wasn't worth the effort and they wanted to chuck it all and give up. But then how would they ever have really benefited, found deeper faith, deeper love, closer relationship to God, and been trained in God's school if they had not gone through it? to get safely to the other side. The great heroes of faith understood this, that sometimes great relationships happen when that relationship is strained to the breaking point, but does not break. You think of Abraham climbing Mount Moriah with his son Isaac, wondering if God is going to make him go through with this sacrifice. Or Joseph, so long in Pharaoh's dungeon, wondering where this is going to end up and when the sun will shine again. Or the ancient sufferer Job scratching his sores beneath the beating sun. Or Moses crying out to God for a new call. Or David running for his life 
in the desert from Saul? Or Elijah lying down in the wilderness and just wanting to die? Or the apostles hunted down and hounded by their enemies throughout their missionary journeys? These all understood we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. His hand, our hand, through to the other side. So the prophet Isaiah, the words of the Lord, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, the flames will not kindle upon you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Or the sweet psalmist of Israel in Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come, said the writer, of amazing grace. The advent of the gospel comes to us as it has come to many others when people have been willing to go through the things that God asked of them. We know that we cannot always go around the troubles, but God invites us, take my hand, I will go through it with you. For God hath not promised skies always blue, flowers strewn pathways all our lives through. God hath not promised sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. But God hath promised strength for the day, rest for the labor, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, unfailing sympathy, and his undying love. Amen. Peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. So keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
Let us offer up our prayers this morning for Brian Berg, who will undergo surgery on Wednesday, and for Carol Praber, the mother of Mrs. Gwen Mankey, who is struggling with cancer. Let us pray. O Lord, you are the great physician of soul and body. You chasten and you heal. We pray that you would look with mercy on your servants and restore their strength. You gave your son to bear our infirmities and sicknesses. Deal compassionately with your servants and bless the medical means employed on their behalf with your healing power. We commit them to your gracious mercy and protection, for you are a faithful and merciful God for Jesus' sake. Amen. And we also pray, merciful God and Father, we thank thee that thou hast caused the Son of Righteousness to rise upon those that dwelt in darkness. And we beseech thee graciously break the power of darkness in our hearts, that we may continually increase in the knowledge of thy truth and serve thee in righteousness and true holiness through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant to your church the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes from above. Let nothing hinder your word from being freely proclaimed to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, so that we may serve you in steadfast faith and confess your name as long as we live. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
we welcome our visitors and invite you to sign the guest register. The 2015 offering envelopes are available downstairs. Please read up. Thank you.